Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church, and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. Morning. My name's uh, Daniel Morgan, one of the lead pastors here at Res Church. We are finishing up a series today on parenting called The Basic Instructions of Parenting. We were supposed to talk about how to raise godly children, and uh, I realized I, I needed to change the title and kind of purpose of the sermon. We're going to finish up this series, but I actually want to uh, talk about what to do when I'm failing at parenting. Uh, and I think this is going to be uh, more appropriate, and I'll kind of explain why. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher, once said, he who thinks it is easy to bring up a family has never had one of his own. <laughs> In the last two weeks, uh, as we've gone through this series, we've given you lots of things, a bunch of things, really, that the Bible says that you should do as a parent, and a bunch of things that the Bible says you should not do as a parent. Uh, but the reality is that all of us fall short in a lot of different areas when it comes to parenting. We, we, we're lax somewhere, and the, and the reason for that is that we're all messy people, and so our parenting is too. Just consider this fact. 69% of American men frequently participate in watching porn. Over 40% of American women frequently watch porn in the United States. So how then, if that's such a large portion of our culture, do, just as this example, do they turn and then teach integrity and honesty and sexual purity to their kids? Well, that would be a bit of a problem, wouldn't it? And you can actually take any example you'd like. Um, think about how many, I mean, if you're in the bucket of people who have never lost their temper, congratulations. <laughs> But we're going to lose our temper, or we're going to be impatient, or we're going to be rude, and then we're going to turn around and somehow try to raise kids that aren't impatient and angry and rude. It's a problem. It's a struggle. How can imperfect people who sometimes can't get the most basic things right raise kids who aren't total dysfunctional losers? Now, maybe that doesn't seem like a problem for you, but I've got to be honest with you. If it doesn't seem like a problem for you, either you aren't raising kids or you are delusional in your self-righteousness. Welcome to Resurrection Church. <laughs> it's going to be one of those Sundays. See, I don't think we have a knowledge problem at all. I think uh, we have a heart problem. In fact, I think, yes, there are things you need to learn about parenting and you can always learn more about parenting, but the problem is that even once you learn everything about parenting, you still can't do it. So even once you fix all of the knowledge problems, 
We still lack the power to make those changes. And if you have not been frustrated by that, I, I, one, I don't think you're parenting, or two, I, really, this mimics the Christian life. Where you begin to understand what it would look like to live a godly life and then begin to realize, oh my gosh, I am nowhere close to that. I, 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 I love my spouse, but why do I have such a difficult time controlling my emotions and, and submitting to my spouse when appropriate and, and serving them well and admitting when I'm wrong and being patient? Like, if I know what to do and I want to do it, but I don't seem to be able to do it. If, if, if I, I know the right choice in my head, but don't seem to be able to live that out. It's a heart problem. And so we're going to talk about heart problems and we're going to talk about heart power today. Heart problems and heart power. Here's the big idea. I'll give it to you now. You can write it down. We're going to start here and end here. We fix failing parenting by forfeiting control and following Jesus. We fix failing parenting by forfeiting control and following Jesus. See, the more I thought about my own concerns and failures as a parent, the more it reminded me of just the essential problem of the Christian life. The idea that even after we meet Jesus and he saves us, we're still stuck in this body that has a sinful nature. We call this, the Bible calls this a sinful nature. And if, just some quick definitions if you're new to this whole Bible thing. Sin is anything, any thought, any deed that is contrary to God, contrary to his character, his order, his commands. And a sin nature or sinful nature is what happened when the first sin was committed all the way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve lived there, that first disobedient act. Adam and Eve have since passed that down from generation to generation. You and I have been born under the curse of sin into a sinful nature. And every parent intuitively knows that we're born sinful because you've had a kid and you've watched them. No one had to teach them to smack their brother and steal the toy. In fact, when you see it, you go, who taught you that? No one. It's a heart problem. You don't have to teach your kid to lie. Somehow, they learn that on their own. You can believe in the theory that every person was born good until you have kids. Good luck after that. Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote a good portion of the New Testament and planted most of the churches in the New Testament, recorded in his most vulnerable moment in the Bible this exact problem in Romans chapter 7. Now, there's a couple of people. We're going to read this today. It's our main passage. It can be in Romans 7 today. Uh, there are a few people that believe that Paul was not writing about himself here, that he was sort of writing about a theoretical person or writing about his time before Christ. Uh, but I would tell you that just for time's sake, you're going to have to go with me that the preponderance of evidence, uh, most theologians and historians believe that the Apostle Paul was writing about himself after salvation. Uh, he's talking about a struggle to follow Jesus. And if, if you're not sure about that, I have a bunch of background for you. You can find me after the service, and I'll give you a bunch of notes on that if you care, but it would take all service to kind of go through that. So Paul's been writing a letter to the church in Rome, and, and by the time we get to Romans 7, and, and one of the things that he's really focused on in this book is trying to explain to them why the law of God, so, so, so the, what started as the Ten Commandments and, and, and then been tra uh, passed down as sort of the, not, not just the moral framework, but even the, the life behavior that was necessary to follow God in the Old Testament, why the law of God was good, but why that it wasn't enough for God to just give us the facts, the knowledge, and go, now, go do it. And it didn't work. Even though we knew all the right things to do, we couldn't do it. We couldn't get it done. We couldn't save ourselves. And so um, these people that he's writing to are struggling with legalism and moralism, this idea that if I just act good, I'm fine. Do any of you know anyone like that? Oh, it's not you, clearly. But you probably know somebody like that. Things like if I, I, I set up my, I got these boxes, and if I just check these boxes, then me and God are good. In fact, if I check these boxes, He owes me something. Because I did my part, God. Now, we notice those boxes do actually change over time, and we're very easy graders on ourselves. You ever notice that we grade on a curve? Well, not as bad as she is. Essentially, what Paul is saying is it's not enough to know the right thing to do because I still can't do it. 
And that's what I'm telling you about perfect parenting or perfect living or perfect marriage or anything else in this life, is that even after Jesus saves you, there is still this desperate need for him every day. And we love to minimize it, we love to ignore it, we, lo- we, we love to act like we're just crushing life when in fact we're struggling. And if we're self-aware, we get to this terrifying feeling that we are screwing everything up. And so we're going to go through Romans chapter 7 from verses 15 to chapter 8 verse 2 today. You can open your Bible, I'll be reading from the ESV, it says this. For I do not understand my own actions, <laughs> for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Does that sound familiar to you? Let me, let me, let me ask you this. Um, have you ever met an addict? And I've, I've walked with a lot of people through addictions, particularly uh, substance abuse. And I will tell you, this is one of the truest things that I've ever heard, is people will intellectually know that the, the, that substance or that drug is killing them, and they cannot seem to shake it. I cannot do the very thing I want to do, the very thing I hate doing, I keep doing. And here's the thing about being an addict. The thing about being an addict is to be a Christian, we must first come to the realization that we are addicted to sin. So an addict is not that person. An addict is this person. And to believe otherwise is to be ignorant or self-righteous or deluded. In fact, the marker that Jesus saved you is to understand that you are an addict. If you think you have mastery over sin and you don't really need him, I w- look out, man, look out. He, l- listen to me, if you are internally rolling your eyes at me, look out. Verse 16, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. What does that mean? He's saying, listen, when I do something evil, it's something sinful, I highlight how good the law is. I, when, when I steal and someone sees it and someone knows it, it makes everyone who witnesses that act recognize the goodness, the rightness of the law not to steal. When you do something wrong, we all really enjoy that there's a law that says that's wrong. Because we, but inherently, we know there should be justice. Verse 17, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. This is the sinful nature that we're talking about. This is established in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned. Every person has sinned because we were born into sin. Romans 5, 12 would say it this way. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death came because of sin, death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Adam sinned, therefore you and I were born of Adam. We have a sinful nature, we're born into it. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is my flesh. Now, Paul is saved by Jesus, so he has a little caveat here. He says, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. What is he saying? He's saying, well, I've been saved, so I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in me, and yet I can tell everything other than the Spirit is not good. This is why we lose our minds a little bit when when someone's like, I just got to follow my heart. I'm like, don't do it. Don't follow your heart. Your emotions will betray you. Your heart is wicked. Don't listen to that. If you're listening to anything other than the spirit or spirit-led work in your life or spirit-led work in someone else's life, don't do it. Nothing good dwells within me in my flesh. If you, when we aren't listening to the Spirit, when we're listening to something else that is internal, feelings and emotions and thoughts and desires and dreams that are not of God, that is in the category of nothing good. And here's what he says. This is the key. For I have the desire to do what is right. That desire comes from God, by the way. That's how we know he's saved. Because you don't even desire to do what's right before you get saved. You may have peer pressure or social pressure or cultural pressure to do something right. You might even have self-interest to do something right so that people give you accolades and affirmation. But to just to do something right that is selfless, that behavior comes from God. That's actually a great sign that God is working on you. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Can you relate? I know I should pray for my kids unceasingly. I know I should read them the Bible every single night. I know I should stop buying them fast food and cook home-cooked, free-range, non-HMO meals. 
I know I should respond in love and grace every time, and I should be more patient, and I should be more involved, and I should stop rolling my eyes when we have another dance recital. <laughs> but it's hard! You ever made a New Year's resolution for your family and watched how fast that died? I have the desire. I talked to a guy uh, that, that uh, was in one of my small groups one time, and he goes, man, I don't understand it. I go to a marriage conference, and I agree with everything I hear. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And it lasts like 11 days. What's wrong with me? And I was like, you're human. We're all that way. You're either that way or you're lying. Verse 20. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. This is the story arc of the Bible, right? That there is a cancer, a curse that we're born into that affects all of us, and none of us have the power to get past it, and there's no cure, and someone had to make a way. Verse 21, so I find it to be a law. This, this word in Greek would read more like a rule of thumb or a principle. So I find it to be a principle. I find it to be a rule of thumb that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Again, no one delights in the law of God unless God is already working on them. Verse 23, but I see in my members, my mind, my body, my desires, my, 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 my flesh, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. This is, this is the struggle of the Christian life. If, if Paul, the apostle Paul, who, who, who writes, a, a, about half of the New Testament is recorded of, of Paul writing letters to churches and, and acts that he did. As he, as if Paul, an apostle, is telling you there is a war, not a, a war in his, in his body between a, a righteous desire and a sinful desire, then, then why, why do you and I feel like it hasn't been necessary to confess and repent in 20 years? Where does this self-righteous attitude come from in American churches? Listen, verse 24. Wretched man that I am. He does not have a high view of himself. He's not going, killing it. Another selfie on Instagram. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he answers his own question in verse 25. Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I love that song. I want you to meet my Jesus. Oh. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There's no chapter markers in the original letter. We're going to go right into eight because it's one continuous thought. There is therefore now no condemnation, no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So the struggle is not just real, and the struggle is real. It is normal, and it is not condemning. It is not shameful. Let, let me ask you a super serious question. I mean, this is the thing that just bothers me all the time about, about growing up in America, in American Christianity, and, and trying to understand how we got so off kilter. How come recovery ministries always feel more honest than church services? Now, just think about it for a second. If you've ever been, I, whether, it, whether it's CR, whether it's AI, you go to any recovery ministry and listen to the honesty and then go to a church service and go, huh. Doesn't that bother you? It, it bothers me. If we're all addicted to sin, and the Bible says that we're all addicted to sin because we're born into sin, and even the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, this struggle is so real, and it's so present, and it's so prevalent in your life, then, then how come we are being open about being in recovery? Because if you're a believer, then you're in recovery for an addiction to sin. And when you read the Bible, when you read about Jesus, when you read about Paul, everything in here looks and sounds and smells like recovery ministry. And I, I, I want to submit to you that when, if you want to parent well, even though you're a mess, we're going to have to do it the way the, the Bible prescribes, the, the way the Bible talks about it, which is living an authentic Christian life. I said authentic. Because there's plenty of people living fake Christian lives. 
just based on averages, there are people living fake Christian lives watching this sermon right now, sitting in the pews or online. That's just the culture we live in. See, authentic Christian life is marked by three critical behaviors. And if you have them, they should give you immense confidence that Jesus has saved you and he is working on you and he will complete what he started. You will have great hope in the future. You'll have great encouragement. Your eternity is sealed. And the, the same three behaviors is what we use to fix failed parenting. Three things, three things that mark an authentic Christian and that will help us fix messy parenting. Here they are. Continually be these three things. Number one, brutally honest. Number two, shockingly vulnerable. Number three, pathetically desperate. Brutally honest, shockingly vulnerable, pathetically desperate. These three things not only mark the authentic Christian life, but they really highlight the difference between recovery ministry and your average American church service. Because you go to recovery, you're going to hear brutally honest, shockingly vulnerable, and pathetically desperate people. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is how we must parent as well. Why? Because most of what we read in the Bible about parenting is modeling behavior, doing it, living it out for our kids to see. And what do we want? We've talked about this for two weeks now. This is week three. We want kids who are vibrant, healthy, high character, and love Jesus. We want disciples of Jesus. Well, you've heard you are what you eat. Well, you raise what you are. That should be sobering. You raise what you are. Listen, side note, this is what we aspire to as preachers here at Res. This is what we aspire to do. We know we have to model behavior. So when we walk up to the pulpit, while we want to open the Bible and we want to preach God's word, we want to do it while continually being brutally honest, shockingly vulnerable, and pathetically desperate. And that is not fun, by the way. (laughs) If you're wondering. To get up here and spill your guts. Like, we're not masochists. We don't enjoy the pain. We are compelled to lead this way. So I'm going to give you three stories from the Bible about Jesus. All three of them, they're going to illustrate these three points. And honestly, there's a lot more than just three. I mean, there's a ton of this in the Bible. This is, this is right now in the middle of the lane for gospel culture. But, but if we'll live these out, if we'll begin to do these, we'll, we'll begin to grow in gospel culture in our church and in our homes, in the living rooms, and with our kids. And so let's start with the first one, brutally honest with your kids. How to be brutally honest with your kids. Um, There's a story in John 4, and you need to know a little bit of background about this in order to understand it, but but Jesus and his followers are all Jewish, and so the one thing that you didn't do in the first century um, was associate with any Samaritans. Samaritans um, were like Raider fans. Is that, no, no, sorry. Um, season, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Samaritans, Samaritans had been ostracized, uh, ostracized from Jews uh, centuries earlier uh, because of some conflict and some intermarriage that they'd had where they intermarried with some oppressors and because of that they were seen as a sort of ceremonially unclean. They were a, an unclean people according to Jews. They would not associate with them. They wouldn't talk to them. They wouldn't be around them. They certainly wouldn't share any utensils with them. And if you had to get, if you had to go west from Jerusalem, then you would have to go through Samaria and no one would even do that. So they would take these huge routes around Samaria just to not even stand in the land that Samaritans lived in. And Jesus says, I have an appointment. He takes his disciples. He walks right dead through the center of Samaria. He meets a woman at a well outside of a town. That well is miles outside of the town in the middle of the heat of the day. And there's a lady there. And we find out that that woman is there because she's been so ostracized from her people that she can't even go around the the well that is close to the town because of all the other women in the town who have ostracized her and have just been brutally and incessant with her and so she's hiding from 
even her own people, and Jesus associates to, with her and begins to talk to her, which is just, again, culturally so shocking. She's like, how are you even talking to me right now? First of all, I'm a Samaritan, and I'm a woman, and then she thinks he doesn't know about all her past, but he does, and so he's trying to engage her with the gospel, and he's trying to talk to her about, about salvation, and she's very defensive and very evasive, and so finally he's like, he's trying to turn the screws very gently with her, and he finally says something that would have actually been pretty appropriate, which is, go get your husband and come back, because uh, I need your husband to be here to talk to both of you since I'm a, a male. He, this is what he says. He says, uh, verse 16, John 4, 16, he says this, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. That's a very normal response. What's abnormal is that he's even talking to her. Verse 17, the woman answered him, I have no husband. Oh, man, your kids have done this too. Lying by omission. No? <laughs> When you tell a lie, but it's not really a lie. We call those white lies. You know what that means? Lies. They're just lies. When you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, we call that sin. When you know the truth, but you say something different, but it's not really a lie, that's sin, that's lies. She's lying. She's covering something up right here. And Jesus calls her on it. It's the worst. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What I have said is true. Mic drop. <laughs> Man, this ain't the internet days. He didn't look her up on social media. She's going like, what? There's no way you could know my past. Jesus knows all of it. He's sitting there and he's like, okay, sure, I'll call you on that. <laughs> he's not being mean. I, I understand this. He's, he's not using the truth as an excuse to be mean. You don't get to use the truth as a weapon, Amen. believer. He is engaging her and being just brutally honest. You're right. You don't have a husband. But here's the actual truth. Here's the application. Jesus says this consistently. He balances this gentleness with this brutal honesty. And at some point you look at him and you go, man, is he being mean, but he loves them so much? Like, I, like how, do you, how do you just? We have to be brutally honest. First with ourselves. Man, you've got to be brutally honest about yourself and with yourself. And secondly, stop lying to your kids. Stop lying to your kids. Listen, um, I made a huge error last Christmas when I accidentally was talking about a fictional character named... His name rhymes with pantapause. <laughs> and I may or may not have insinuated that he was mythical <clears throat> in front of all the kids oh, no. during a family service. But one of the reasons that I've never let my kids go down that mythical path and actually believe that's real is because I don't want to establish that I lie to them about anything. Because there's a, th th my, my primary purpose in raising them is that they will come to a real convictional belief in an invisible God. So how am I going to lie to them about mythical creatures, but then want them to believe me about a mythical God or an invisible God, right? Like, like I, I, I have to be honest because I'm building a confidence in them that what I say is actually true. So don't lie to them. Now, you can have fun and decide what you want to do with pantapause. All you want. I don't care. Here's what you do need to care about. The primary reason that most of us are not honest with our kids is actually in situations where we don't want to admit that we're wrong. And we don't want to apologize. And we don't want to take responsibility for what we've done. So we lie. We don't want to take the time to explain a delicate situation. So we lie. I know there's some, some other reasons, but listen, a lot of times we just don't want to take the time. So, so you're in a sticky situation where someone's getting divorced and you don't want to talk about the complexities with your kid, so you just lie to them. And it can lead down some weird stuff. We were like brutally honest with our kids about stuff that happened in the family. And I remember like Avery walking up one time at like four and just being like, you got divorced and that's a sin. And I was like, shh, 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 shh. what are you doing? Like, like there's some downsides. But the alternative is to not be honest. You got to be honest. You've got to be brutally honest with yourself and with your kids. 
And most of the time we're not honest, not because of their better welfare or anything else, it's because we're lazy. Our, 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 our dishonesty primarily comes from pride and laziness. Secondly, we've got to be shockingly vulnerable with others. Shockingly vulnerable. Listen to Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God. He has been leading 12 disciples and training them and teaching them, and they, they've begun to understand his authority and the fact that he is the Son of God. And I mean, they're, they're expecting him to take over Rome and be the king and lead them in a rebellion and all this stuff, right? He's the leader of everything, and yet he knows he's going to the cross. So he, the night before, he's in the garden, and he's praying, and he's sharing all of the vulnerability with his disciples. Matthew 26, 36 through 43, he says, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled, and he didn't hide it from them. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going on a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He's saying that where they can hear it. This is the guy that's supposed to be in charge. He's not supposed to have any doubts. He's not supposed to have any weaknesses. He's not supposed to... Not only does he have them, he shares that with them. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again for the second time, he went and prayed, Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping with their eyes heavy. Think about the vulnerability of the Apostle Paul writing Romans 7. He, he is founding churches all over the world at this point, and yet he's going to write a letter that will become canonized as Scripture talking about his weakness, his struggle, the, the spiritual battle that is being waged inside of him. You've got to be vulnerable with others, and you've got to be vulnerable with your kids. Not as an excuse to fail, not as an excuse to be lazy, but they will trust you more. Why would they believe you need Jesus or they need Jesus if you act like you don't? Right. I was, um, I, I have a lot, you guys, if you've been here a while, know I have a lot of dreams where God, God, God does uh, real work in me. And I, I had a dream a couple weeks ago uh, that there was a school shooting at my son's school. And it was one of those Uvalde moments where no one would go in. And I, I was the hero, by the way. So I ran in. I jumped the fence. Don't ask me how I got over the fence. And, and, I, and I took care of the shooter. Don't ask me how I did that. I don't remember in the dream, but it was very heroic. Just, it was not at all clumsy. So I was a hero. And I was, you know, save my son, save school. Everyone's excited. And, uh, good dream until I woke up later in the night and, uh, and, 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 and God started to talk to me about some of the things that I struggle with. And I've shared with you, I've struggled with how I consume alcohol. It just, it makes me lazy, right? And, I, and, and I've always justified that as, well, I don't get drunk, so it's clearly not sinful. Um, but, but yet, God convicts me. And so I, I wake up later in the night and, and God says, um, hey, so you'll run into gunfire for your son, but you won't give up alcohol? That's not the dream I was hoping for, Lord. <laughs> Mine involved the lotto. I was like, you'll run into gunfire for your son, but you can't manage how much time you spend on this computer. Because the point of the Christian life is not one big declaration, this one-time moment. Ah, I love you, Lord. I'm gonna be a Christian. Yeah, woo! It's these daily giving up things that might pull you away from the Lord. And so, I, you know, I started to think about this. You know, I've always thought about the word alcoholic as a person who just can't stop getting drunk, can't stop drinking, uh, and they're drunk all the time, and it's ruining their life and everything. But what if alcoholic is just someone that continually finds themselves doing something they don't want to do, which sounds very familiar, right? Like, like when you open up the fridge and there's a bottle of, of alcohol or a can of alcohol or whatever in there, and you're like, how did this get there? but the receipt's in your pocket. 
And so I thought, you know what, I, if, I, if I lived my life like I was an alcoholic, I would actually live a much more liberating life. If I lived my life like I was addicted to sin, like I was an addict and I was in recovery, I would live a much more li- liberating life. So I decided I'm going to live my life like I'm an alcoholic. I'm going I'm to clean all this out. I'm going to stop drinking for the rest of my life. Why? Because I want to? No. Because I, I think I, you have to come to this realization that we're addicted to sin. And for the believer, someone that's put their faith in Christ, uh, most of what is going to di- pull you from Jesus is not like morally negative things. It's morally neutral things that begin to, to creep into your heart and, and pull your affection away from the Lord. And then you know what you have to do after that? Then you have to go. So, so here's the next thing. Then I, then I got to go to all my accountability and start talking to them about this. I got to go to my wife and go, hey, you know what? I think I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, what? I was like, well, maybe the definitions are off, but close enough. And then I got to go to my small group and go, you know what? I, I think I'm an alcoholic. I don't think I can actually control this on my own, and I shouldn't have to. Why, why would I? Matt Chandler talks about it this way. He says, when you take sin and you bring it into your house, whatever it is, right, for you that you struggle with, when you know you're struggling with something, you bring it into your house. It's like, it's like taking a baby lion cub and bringing it into your house like a pet because it's really cute. But then as it grows, weird things start to happen, like the dog disappears. <laughs> and that still may be manageable until one of your kid disappears. And by the time you realize it, because the little cute thing that you brought into your home is now an apex predator and is killing you. Because the only actual response to sin that, that, that we have in the Bible is to take that out in the backyard and put a bullet in its head and bury it. Don't play with it and coddle it. Do you love me? That's what Jesus asks. Obey my commandments. Okay. Third thing, we have to be pathetically desperate for Jesus. Yes, pathetically desperate. That word is there on purpose. Pathetically desperate. Where we decrease so he increases. Matthew 9, 20 through 22. Jesus is walking somewhere with his disciples. Verse 20, and behold, a woman who has suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Do you believe this story? Because yes. if this is true, it changes everything, doesn't it? Man, if I, could, if I could just get to Jesus, it could change everything. In uh, 1780, there was a man born named Thomas Chalmers. He became a very famous pastor, preachers, founded a church, um, and he wrote a book called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. It's one of the hardest books I've ever read, but it's phenomenal. Here's what it says. He calls the heart a, the toughest of fibrous roots. He says, you cannot change your heart by getting rid of things. In fact, he says, the things you desire, you can't stop loving things you love by trying really hard to stop loving them. So if you really like anger, you can't get rid of anger by trying to stop being angry. It doesn't work. If you've fallen in love with the things of this world, you don't actually stop falling in love with them just because you tried hard. This is, that's not how the heart works. That's what the Bible tells us about the heart. He says the only way to get rid of those things that you find in your heart is to fall in, some, in love with something greater. It's called the expulsive power of a new affection, that if I could fall in love with something greater, it will push out everything else that was in there. It's why we don't preach moralism to you. Hey, you should try really hard to be good. It will never work. We preach the majesty and magnificence of Christ. That if you will fall just a little bit more in love with him today, he will begin to force things out of your heart and you will walk away from them because he is better and greater and grander than everything else that you're holding on to. And so we're just going to continue to talk about Jesus. 
about who he is and what he is and how much he loves you because if you will chase after him, he will push those other things out of your heart. The other reason we don't generally preach a lot of morality to you, you already know what you're doing is wrong. You need to fall in love with Jesus more deeply. You already know what you're doing is wrong. If you could have stopped, you would have a long time ago. So, so when, when I, I preach my best sermons, it's because before I got up here, I was on my knees desperately asking for God to show up with a real realization that I will fall flat on my face if I walk up here and without his power and his grace and his understanding try to say anything at all. My best parenting is when I desperately seek Jesus. I'm trying and failing, but I'm seeking Jesus. Because I know that my best is not even close to good enough. You see, we fix failing parenting by forfeiting control and following Jesus. Where do you go from here? What do you do with this? How do you, how do you go about actually enacting the brutal honesty, the shocking vulnerability, and the pathetic desperation in Jesus? It's a good question. Glad I asked it. Here's the first thing. First question. Do you know him? Have you put your faith in Christ at all? Because if you don't know him, man, that's the very first step. I want you to meet my Jesus. Will you do me a favor and bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? I want to ask you to consider that about your own life. Only you can answer this question today. Jesus died on a cross to offer you a new life today, the chance to repent, to turn from sin, and to be saved by him. But you have to take it. Jesus paid for your sins so that you could come into his embrace and his comfort and his peace, so that there would be someone to fall in love with that would push out all those other desires of your heart. And if you've not put your full faith in Jesus and surrendered your life to him, I want to offer you the chance to do that today. We read that Romans 3.23 says that every single person, you and I, have sinned, we've fallen short, we deserve death. But Romans 9 says that you and I can be saved if we declare with our mouth, that's verbally, and we ask and we put our faith in God. That's, that, 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 is, that is our affection. We turn our affection toward God. And if you're willing to ask him for forgiveness and salvation, with every eye closed, with every head bowed, just quietly or even silently, repeat this prayer after me. Something just like this. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm lost on my own, and my best is not good enough. I'm incapable of living perfectly, and I need you to save me. So I surrender everything to you, even the hard things. In full confidence, I receive your promise of relationship, of the forgiveness of my sins, the presence of your Holy Spirit, and of eternal life. Be my Lord and King, please, Jesus. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you be brave and raise your hand for me to see? Just for me. Amen. Thank you. Put your hands down. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Jesus loves you. He loves you more than you realize. He has a future for you, for you that's so far better than you actually dream it is right now. And if you said that prayer moments ago, welcome to the family. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when a single person gives their life to Christ. They party like it's 1999. Now, 
If you know Jesus, and yet you've been sitting here and you've been thinking about like, okay, great, I know him, but that struggle is just as real for me as it is for all the things you're talking about. Where, where, where do I go when it comes to applying these steps and actually doing these things in my life? Because man, it's great to, to get started, but I never seem to make it more than a week or two. Here's a couple things to work on for parenting. Number one, I would take these points. I, I, I think these three points, the idea of being brutally honest, shockingly vulnerable, and pathetically desperate for Jesus are at the heart of gospel culture, of the average Christian life. Take them, write them down, tape them to your mirror, tape them to your fridge, write them in your Bible, carry them with you. Remind yourself of them and encourage yourself by them over and over and over again. Secondly, you and I need not just God's help, but God's people to live this life. You need community. Not only do you need to be in community, in an intimate community, we, we call that community groups here. Not only do you need to be in that, you need to be vulnerable and honest in those groups. And that requires risk. And so I want to invite you when we're done. Uh, we have a couple ways you can begin to connect with us. We have a way you can join groups if you'd like. We're going to do something over here uh, right after service where we get to meet some people. We'd love to talk to you about what it looks like to get in community. But if you're already in community, here's what I would ask you to do. I would ask you to sit down and think through, have I been brutally honest? Have I been shockingly vulnerable? Have I been pathetically desperate for the Lord in my community? And so uh, right now, our prayer team and our elders are going to come up here. We're going to sing a song. You guys can stand up. We're going to sing a song. If you need prayer. In fact, you know what we're going to do? We're going to open up this altar. If there are things on your heart that you need to repent of, if there are areas where you want to seek the Lord, man, you just want to talk to him, this altar is going to be open. You can come up here and pray. You can come up and pray with us. If you want to encourage me, you want to pray with us, we would love to pray with you. You move as the Lord leads you, and we'll sing this song together. We love you.